Okay, uh, League of Women's Voters is on March 5th, they're gonna have a, uh, gonna have a, uh, a get together, Let's take a picture of this slide. And uh, League of Women's Voters are great. They, they all do great presentations and uh, they have great information. These four Capitol Police officers uh, testified at a hearing and they've been vilified by the right, of course, uh, that, you know, it's back to blue until they don't. So, uh, which is, it's pretty disgusting. But anyway, uh, these, these four, Mike Fanon, uh, Dan Hodges, uh, Harry Dunn and, and uh, Aquilino Ganell, uh, you might want to write a note to them, uh, thanking them for testifying at the at the, the January 6th select committee because uh, they did, uh, I'm sure they didn't expect the backlash that they got and we're all grateful to them. The New York Times uh, reported, and I'm sure you've all heard this so far, that, uh, that they called the uh, January 6th insurrection on the Capitol is legitimate political discourse. And uh, I don't really have any words other than that. I'm ho just hopeful that Democrats running for office can use this to their advantage. And instead of just the, uh, you know, in their campaign and actually require, you know, get these guys to say, would you think it was legitimate political discourse versus, you know, and they'll of course run the other way and they'll say, they'll try to, they'll twist themselves into political pretzels to try to figure out uh, what they, uh, you know, try to justify what they're saying, but uh, hopefully the Democrats running for office can use this. Take a picture of this slide. I know that I saw Al Mitty on, on here and uh, Al is part of this Veterans for Peace and World Beyond War. And uh, this is a, on February 23rd, uh, there's going to be a, a online debate. Uh, I think we'll be able to get that posted on uh, either the Buzz or somewhere. I don't see a link on how to get into that, uh, but we'll we'll let you know how to do that for this online hey, debate. Mike, there's a note from Al that says, um, "Please email me at amytty1950 at gmail.com if you're interested." Oh, cool. Did it go to everybody? Um, oh, yeah, I, it did. I see that okay. now. <laughs> everybody then get on, uh, look in the chat window and get that email address for Al. So you can, if you're interested in going to this and seeing this online debate uh, to participate. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. The COP uh, stands for Conference of the Parties, and uh, it's a there's a Glasgow uh, Glasgow Climate Pact calls for 197 countries to report progress towards uh, climate change. The goal is to 90% uh, of the world's to uh, halt and reverse deforestation by 2030. Bill Gates is optimistic. Uh, Greta Thunberg. Thunberg, I mean, uh, is pretty pessimistic about this. And she's uh, she's pretty blunt and direct. So I don't know if you've ever, I know you know who she is, you've seen her, but she, uh, I know that a lot of, of uh, conservatives and certainly conservative radio and TV don't, don't like her because she is so blunt and direct about uh, addressing climate change. And it's, it's gonna be their world in their age. I believe she's probably 18 now. Thank you. Our speaker for today, our guest speaker is Ash Marwa. And uh, Ash is a village resident. He's running for the uh, Florida House of Representatives in District 33. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to you, Ash. Are you ready to go? Thank you. Thank you everyone for supporting me. Thanks for this invitation to allow me to speak to all of you. Um, it has been a wonderful journey these last four months. 
I have run local elections in Pittsburgh, so I know how it feels. And this, I can tell you, it feels terrific. I, I am really thankful that you're all going on my website, ashford33.com, either directly or through the Villages Democrats website. And you're signing my petitions, sending the petitions. Also, I have started receiving donations. I really appreciate that. Appreciate all the support that I'm getting. And I want to especially thank Dee Melvin. Dee is my treasurer. She's my right hand, actually. She's, she's my co-representative. Thank you, Dee. Thank you for what you have done with me for these past four months. And now to the subject of this campaign. It is really my opponent's conflict of interest. And it is the preemptive laws in Florida that, that he keeps promoting and signing, which, which are affecting our lives, which are taking away local control. And these, let me start with my favorite preemptive law, which is the impact fee. And in my view, at least, the impact fee issue started in 2004, when in the villages, they approved one Sumter, and one Sumter allowed everybody to vote for all the county commissioners. But what it really did was the developer got control of all of the county commissioners. All of the politics of the county were under the control of the developer. It was his employees or employees of sister companies who were county commissioners. In fact, Doug Gilpin, who is current, one of the current county commissioners, he is a longtime employee of TND companies. What that did was we got lulled into this good life, into this Disneyland of, for the seniors. And they kept doing things. I remember six years ago, we were the first time we came here. I saw that the county issued a $6 million bond to build roads south of C44, CR44. And, and I realized, okay, I guess, they are paying for roads south of 44, but I didn't realize the significance of it. 2018, there was an agreement between the county and the developer on, on the roads, how the county is gonna pay for the roads. We still didn't realize what was happening till 2019 when our taxes went up 25% and the county borrowed $40 million. That's when there was a revolt. And that's when people said they are not gonna allow these county commissioners to continue. So in 2020, the three incumbents were defeated. And now jump to last year, 21, one of the first things that the county commissioners did was put reverse one center on the ballot. And we should be really thankful to them for that because that is on the ballot because of that vote. And the second thing they were doing and they actually accomplished, they increased the impact fee on the developer the impact fee was $972 per house. And they increased it 73% to $1,701, which is still well below the comparable rate in Lake County, which is $2,706 for a 1,500 to 2,500 square foot house. Now, I want to make one thing clear. The impact fee is paid by the developer when they come to develop barren land. 
I noticed some people were confusing it with the bond payments that we make on our houses. This has nothing to do with the bond payment. This is the impact fee. It's a one-time fee the developer pays at the start of the development. So while this was happening, my opponent, and I want to name him, Brett Haig. Brett Haig engineered or co-sponsored HB 337 in Tallahassee. And he, he must have really worked the halls of the Capitol because from January through by the end of May, he got it through both houses and it was approved. And I'm, I'm dating it because on June 4th, he filed his Form 6 disclosure. And I want to show you that Form 6 disclosure where he got a $350,000 check from the developer. It's, it's unreal what is happening. Here is the check. And you can see it, his only income is from the state of Florida for 29,697 and then the 350,000 from the developer plus the 14 cents, I don't know what that is for. Um, but this, this is really amazing that June 4th, when he announced this check, the governor had still not signed that HB 337. The governor signed it into law on June 9th. Now, it, it's, it's a question and it's a question for everyone. What wonderful work did he do to deserve that kind of paycheck? And the previous year, if you compare with the previous year, he got $141,000 from the developer. So this was a $209,000 raise in one year. And I want to see what his Form 6 disclosure shows this year. And, and I'm, I'm relating to Form 6 because I want you to know that you can also Google Form 6 in Florida and see what kind of money is he getting. It's the, this was one issue. And then I want to talk about the election, but let me just say that in May, when the law was approved, the county commissioners had already raised the impact fee on the developer earlier than that. But Haig engineered the law to be retroactive to January 1st of 21. What that did was the increase in impact fee was null and void. So our taxes, the 25% increase continues and we continue to pay that year after year. And the impact fee remains at 972, or if they did raise it, they could only raise it 12.5% last year. And with the result that the developer has a huge advantage of building in Sumter County, and, and that's what you're noticing that all the construction is in Sumter County. There's no, none in Lake or Marion County. It's because of this impact fee advantage. The developer has plans to build 65,000 houses and that amounts to a hundred million dollar gift, really. The hundred million that we, the taxpayers are footing. And I want this to be known not just to you, the Democrats. I want the Republicans to know this. I want the independents to know this. I want the no party affiliates to know this because it's affecting us all the same way. The second preemptive law I want to mention is SB 1890. You don't hear about it. You only hear about SB 90. SB 90, we have had discussions, we have had presentations. And one of the, one of the facts in SB 90, just want to point out, is 
that can carry two ballots in addition to your own to the Dropbox. And that's really surprising to me because we have so many assisted living places here in Florida. I'm not sure how people in assisted living places are going to vote in this coming election. Uh, are they all going to ask for mail-in ballots? Because mail-in ballots are also not, you cannot get them for two years anymore. Every, every time, every election, you have to request them. But getting back to 1890, SB 1890, what, what it does is for local elections, some cities have limits on contributions on campaign contributions, like Sarasota had a $200 limit on campaign contributions. Stella has had $250 limit on local elections. This SB 1890 does away with that, and you, you can contribute up to $1,000. They increase the limit. What it does is an incumbent can get 10 people together, collect $10,000 and win the election. It is, for local elections, $10,000 is a huge amount of money. It, what it will do is the incumbents will stay in power, the newcomers, anyone trying to run an election will have extreme difficulty in going through any local election process. And as if this is not the end of it, I just heard yesterday, there is another bill going through the House and the Senate, SP 524. And the SP 524 actually is worse than SP 90. It establishes an Office of Election Crime and Security. It requires annual purging of voter rolls, requires additional identification to vote by mail. I thought there was enough identification in SB 90. Now it looks like it's going to increase that. It raises caps on potential fines against third-party voter registration organizations. It's, it's, it's just getting worse and worse by the day. There is, there is another one, I want to, another preemptive law. And that ties in with what happened with Katie Bell. You know, Katie Bell has been shut down. Katie Bell was in operation under an agreement between the city of Lady Lake developer. That was a 33 year old agreement. Last year, the developer said, no, I don't want to live by this agreement. He sued city of Lady Lake. The, the, supervisor at Lady Lake, they realized the cost of litigation was too high. They gave up. They, so the day they gave up, the next day the developer submits plans for seven apartments. Now I'm telling you all this because what this SB 620 does, it has actually passed the Senate 2214 in January, just two weeks ago it passed and it is in the house. What it does is it says a local business can sue local government, which is exactly what happened. The developer had sued the city of Lady Lake, but it further, it says that the developer can collect damages. Now you can just picture that, that, that there is a lawsuit, there is an expense of a lawsuit. And then if there are damages, there is, then there is that additional expense. I can just see the, our local taxes going through the roof if this bill goes through. And, and the local government, and I have served in local government, they will be, every time they will be looking at an ordinance, they'll be looking to lawyers to say, oh, can I do this? Can I not do this? And even if the lawyer says, oh yeah, you can do this and you do it, there could be another lawyer who disagrees with it and files a suit against the local government. It, it is it's bizarre what is happening. Um, I wanna to touch on two other issues which are not 
the preemptive laws, but which are also affecting us. The, the one is about maintenance fee. And that's, this affects people south of 466, people who are living south of 466. We are paying roughly 99% of the maintenance fee south of, 40, uh, south of 466. The commercial properties in Central Landing and commercial properties in Brownwood, including the newly built the lofts at Brownwood, they are paying roughly 1%. This, this is simply ridiculous. I, I got so concerned about it. I actually filed a complaint with the state attorney general and, and the response from the attorney general was that, that it is a local issue. It's an issue concerning CDDs, community development districts. I, I can go into a lot of detail, but I'll just tell you the way it is happening is the SLCDD, Sumter Landing Community Development District has a, an organization, you probably heard of it, PWAC, Project Wide Advisory Committee. When we send our money for maintenance, this is on, the, on our real estate bill, it goes to our district, but then the district turns over more than half the money to PWAC. And PWAC spends that money for maintenance and they take care of all the commercial properties also. And that's how we are paying for all of the maintenance. Luckily, this requires unanimous consent. And, and now District 7 is objecting to it. And District 7 has hired a lawyer. The lawyer put out a letter and this letter has been sent out to all the districts. And, and in fact, I, I asked in our own district at the last month's meeting, I said, this letter sounds very reasonable. We should support District 7. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know where it's headed but this 99 to one arrangement is not right. And, and this, this flows down from the statute 190 in Florida, which covers community development districts. And, and I can assure you, if I get elected, that's the first thing I'm gonna be looking into is how can we change that? And, and the last but not the least, you have, probably heard of Northern Turnpike Extension. This, I got involved in it shortly after it was announced late last year that Turnpike is considering this extension from Wildwood to somewhere. And here you can see the four routes that they are proposing. The red one is called the Corridor North and the yellow one at the bottom is the corridor south and the purple is corridor central. Anyway, they don't know where they want to go. They don't know where they want to relieve the traffic. It, these are just four options that they are, they are proposing. And, and I have had extensive discussions with the chairman of the Transportation Commission, Mr. Ronald House, about this. But enterprise. Basically, what I told them was that why don't you consider widening I-75 to eight lanes from Wildwood to Ocala. And from Ocala, Route 27 is four lanes and it goes to Chiefland. So if, if you're looking at that red line and if you want to build a, a road like that, you already have I-75 widen it to eight lanes to Ocala, you have four lane 27 going to Chiefland. 
which is hardly used. I understand it's there is hardly any traffic on 27. So there is no need to build this. The, the Sumter County and Wildwood, City of Wildwood are sending a joint letter and they are asking the Turnpike Commission to build the corridor south, which is the yellow line at the bottom. But they also want the yellow, the Wildwood start to stay south of 44. I, they are concerned that the current route will will be really damaging to Wildwood as well as Royal communities. Royal is, as you know, is a historic historic site, uh, historic uh, neighborhood where the slaves were given lands. Um, I'm not sure where this is headed, but another part of my comment on the January 10th to Transportation Commission was that to lay, take a look at a study out of University of Arizona. What this study says is that by year 2038, there may be 17 million homes in retirement communities that are unsold. What they're saying is, and it's, it's an extensive study. If you read through this study, they have used a lot of data to come up with their conclusion. What they're saying is that the current generation of retirees have higher income than the next wave of retirees. So as the baby boomers start dying off, the next generation may not be able to afford these houses. And also, I know personally that because of Uber, people have changed their habits, changed their attitudes about moving from north to south. They are happy staying where they are. So the combination of two is really possible that, that these homes may not be occupied. What that says is that there could be a decline in population in Florida by 2038. And these roads are being built with 20, 30, 50 year plans. And I think they should look at the population growth just, just as, as keenly. Um, but let's see what they do. Anyway, those were the items I wanted to uh, thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me to share all this. And as you can see in all of these, the state representative has a role and what is happening is he is not taking care of the people. And I think it's time to change that. He has to or somebody has to take the interests of the people first and not, not use this as job as to line up his own pocket and make profit for his employer, the developer. Thank you so much. Andy, will you explain the, uh, how to use the Zoom chat? So maybe you can start uh, going through the questions that are in the chat. Um, see, let, let me take each question. Uh, do I have a plan to debate Hague? Yes, I do. I actually offered it to League of Women Voters and they are going to pursue it. So, but it'll be after the primary time period and we'll find out if he agrees to it. From what I hear from D. Melvin in the 2020 election, he didn't want to be seen around her. He didn't show up at joint events. So I don't know if he will debate or not. Um, the, I know the Turnpike Corridor takes out springs, takes out Florida and aquifer. But these plans have been designed from, you know, sitting at a desk. 
the engineers have come up with these options based on what they can or cannot do just from technical standpoint. Now the, comes the time period of public comment and they will find out the details of each route it, and then they will decide which is the best route. Right now what they're doing is it's called alternative corridor evaluation. So they have four corridors, they're gonna evaluate and decide which one is the best. And then they will do what they call the project development and environmental study. And, and that's when all of these details will show up. I, I am still hopeful that they will consider widening I-40. In fact, two weeks ago, I found out that the Florida DOT has actually started two studies to widen I-75 I to eight lanes from Wildwood to Micanopy, which is just short of Gainesville. So the, the idea of I-75 widening is taking shape already. And I also, I read through the DOT's works program. They have not, not accounted for the money from the infrastructure bill that President, bill, President Biden had signed November 15th of 21. So once that money is accounted for in the works program, I am I'm pretty confident that I-75 widening can go on pretty quickly. Um, somebody asked about my professional background. I, I came to US in 1969 in Pittsburgh to Carnegie Mellon University with an engineering degree, civil engineering degree. I was at CMU for two semesters. In May of 1970, I had my master's degree. I just want to share this with you because I had done the master's program in my bachelor's degree in India. I used to watch color TV during my months at CMU. It, it was, I loved the color TV and I knew all the work I had already done it in the structures course. The professor told me I don't have to take the final. I was so scared that I'm not taking the final and I didn't and I, he gave me an A grade in that course. Anyway, 1970, and then I started working in Pittsburgh, 1971, I signed up for the draft. And by that time, the, the lottery had started. And I was never called to serve. 1977, well, 1974, we got married. In uh, 1977, <clears throat> I'm a citizen of US. <clears throat> I, I have worked in civil engineering field all my life. Majority of it was in bridge construction, bridge design, bridge inspection, the road and bridge work. Uh, and you, if you heard of the bridge collapse in Pittsburgh, I did not inspect that bridge, but I somebody made a mistake. Those bridges were inspected every year. Somebody should have done more and that bridge should have never collapsed. And as far as personal, we're very happy to be here. We have three children, three boys. They live in San Diego area, DC and New York. We have seven grandchildren and they come to visit us, it's, it's wonderful. And they all three play golf with me here. Okay, I don't know this Sabatini, who somebody wants to, Sabatini wants to name this highway after Trump. I, I don't know anything about that part. Um, just, 
one other piece of information that this letter, this joint letter from Sumter County and City of Wildwood that is supposed to go to the Turnpike Enterprise, it is part of the City of Wildwood meeting on Monday morning at nine o'clock. And I'm expecting a huge crowd there because people are very upset in Wildwood and Royal uh, seeing what could be coming down the pike. So I want to see what happens over there. Okay, I think I covered all of the questions I see here. Anything else I can add? I, I would love to debate Brett Haig. Okay. Do we have any that, uh, any people have we been able to see anybody that's looking to, that wasn't able to get their chat working? That is no, we just have Larry hand? Bierman putting up a sign about Brett Haig, but that's all. Here's a, a question from Marcia. Um, okay. How close are you to uh, the required number of petitions and when is the due date? The petitions are due May 16th, but I already have enough to qualify for the election. I have filed enough. Uh, so what I am filing now is just showing support and basically it's insurance now because it is quite possible that Brett Hagen and company will challenge all the petitions that I have filed. So I, I want to file extra ones to make sure I'm covered in case of a challenge. I, I need 599 to qualify. I think I have about 650 filed already. Uh, it doesn't show up on the website because Lake County is a little behind and Marion County, I filed some petitions yesterday. So by the time they all show up on the website, it should be 650. Um, the, a couple other questions here. The meeting on Monday in Wildwood is at 100 North Main Street in Wildwood. It's a city of Wildwood meeting. Who is the developer? It is the village's operating company. It is the village's developer. It's the Morse family. Yes, it is the Morse family, uh, which is the developer in villages. I, I use the term developer because it covers a lot of things. I'll use a phrase from uh, my colleague, uh, Marsha Shearer, that this is pretty much a, this, the villages is like a company town and the Morses are like the, the company. So anything that goes through around here, I think that what you'll find is, uh, you know, you'll find that they're very, uh, very influential in how things happen. Uh, Ash touched on that with uh, the impact fees and you would think that everybody who lives here is going to see their taxes increased would have, you know, we all have a dog in that fight and, you know, to see our taxes go up and it doesn't really matter. I don't guess to the Morrises and certainly to the legislature and Hague and, and all them, all them folks, because it's, it's really money, money talks with them. And that's where the Morrises get their influence. It it's unfortunate that they are they are not only taking our money, they are taking our local control of local issues. And, and we don't feel it as much as people in South, Sumter County, Bushnell, Webster, Coleman, Royal, they go see the conditions of roads. I, I drove around the Krumakuchi Baptist Church, and, and the roads have not been paved for 20 years, probably. And here, the Morse Boulevard gets the new blacktop every two years. It's, it's really unfair what is happening uh, to the rest of Sumter County also. 
Yeah. I think I see a really good question. What are the ways you hope to get the word out about you and your position? And I have written to the Daily Sun. They will not publish anything I write to them. <laughs> the other, not at all. <laughs> not at all. But I am in touch with the villages news. I write in the villages news and they do publish it. I am in touch with the property owners association and they have not published anything about me, but they are at least receptive to what I'm saying. And there is another group called Fair Government for Sumter and I'm in touch with them. So what I'm hoping is after the primary season, which actually there is no primary, but after the qualifying period, which is May 16th, I should be able to get more support from these people. Now, there's one other thing I want to mention, that this is the year of redistricting. And it is possible that District 33 will convert to District 52. And what that will do is the district will only consist of Sumter County and half of Hernando County. Right now, District 33 is Sumter County, a small part of Marion, and a small part of Lake County, city of Lady Lake, Fruitland Park, Bellevue. But all those areas will be dropped off and half of Hernando County, Brookville, will become part of the district. So that's the other part. I'm watching what happens. So after the May 16th time period, it will become clear where everything stands. I think Shirley just asked an important question for Ash. Oh, how okay. Can, how, how can we help Ash? Okay. How can, how can we help Ash? Oh, please go on my website, ashfor33.com. And if you can keep on signing petitions, I would welcome that. If you send donations from that website, I would really welcome that. And I think above all, if you can talk to your neighbors, friends, especially Republicans, especially no party affiliates, and tell them about all these issues, what they are doing to us, because I have talked to people, they say, well, it's only a couple hundred dollars. Oh, it's only a little bit here. It's a little bit here. Well, the couple hundred dollars is a hundred million dollars to the developer. The couple hundred dollars is a $350,000 paycheck to Brett Haig. I mean, are they, are they happy with that? Are they okay with that? Um, they're chipping away at our voting rights. Are they okay with that? I mean, you have somebody in assisted living here, they won't be able to send their ballot in. Are they okay with that? It's just every little thing is adding up and I think it's time to make a change. What was your, what, I saw your sign, but it was, I couldn't see. Oh, that's, uh, you know, I, I'm just simply saying, and everybody should know this, that the only, uh, as far as Brett Haig is concerned, uh, <clears throat> his only qualification is cleaning outhouses. That's how he got into the Morse family. He was delivering outhouses around from uh, from uh, development to development, and uh, somehow they picked up on him and uh, then uh, brought him into the uh, uh, brought him into the organization and then promoted him up. Uh, to uh, vice president of outhouses or whatever. I have no idea. I don't think he knows. And if you ever uh, 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 look at some of his uh, uh, deliberations in the Florida uh, uh, House of Representatives, uh, the guy is a stumble bum. I mean, you know, he's on the payroll for, uh, uh, for the Morse family and for Mark Morton and in particular, and that's why he gets 350 grand a year. Uh, he has other no other qualifications. So I think that Brett, uh, listening to Ash, uh, I was impressed with him, and I think that uh, uh, he sounds like a very good candidate. 
unfortunately, I mean, we're, we're outnumbered about three or four to one, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mike, you said about two to one or two to three. It's more like four or five to one, I believe. Someone can, you know, correct me on that. It, it, you know, Republicans versus Democrats. Uh, basically, Republicans always vote, uh, you know, for for Republicans. Uh, hopefully, this time they won't. You, you never can tell. But uh, I was impressed with uh, what Ash had uh, been saying because he's been doing his homework. And this guy sounds like a uh, uh, a a very uh, uh, well informed candidate, unlike Brett Haig, who just votes for whatever Mark Morse tells him to vote for. And uh, so I'm hoping that everybody sends in a contribution to Ash, and uh, makes also make sure that you get in your uh, your peti signed petition. Uh, allowing him to get on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. So, okay, well, it looks like we're gonna finish up then. Thank you, Ash, we appreciate it. Uh, a lot of good feedback so far. And- Got a, you know, every year, uh, those dictionaries like the, uh, I think the, the, I forget exactly which dictionaries, but they, they change, they add words to the dictionary, and this might be added or this might just not be added. But freedom, you know, the belief that your personal freedom outweighs others' personal safety. I believe the president, Biden, President Biden, was right when he said that, you know, this was a pandemic of the unvaccinated, and that's true. And it, it would be okay if they, were, if they were unvaccinated, only infected themselves or their family, but they infect all of us. So, uh, you know, our masks won't, uh, won't get vaccinated. It's like, uh, yeah, who knows? It's, I shake my head a lot on that. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. Yeah, that's... Uh huh? Sorry? Can you put your mask up? My, my mask, it's up. You have to put it over your nose. Sir, it's over my nose. <laughs> oh, wow, that is too cool. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> <laughs> How do you argue with that? <laughs> so, uh, next month, we're hoping that uh, we're going to be doing this in person. Uh, we, we constantly monitor the uh, statistics for COVID and, uh, and safety. Safety is concerned to everybody. It's gonna be warmer weather. Hoping to be in person, like I say. Tomorrow is Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, no matter, I hope your team wins, if you, whoever you're cheering for. Uh, I know not everyone is here from LA maybe, and we might have some people from Cincinnati because uh, LA is pretty, you know, being West Coast, probably don't get as many California. Go Bengals. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'm, uh, I'm from Minneapolis. And I was, till I moved down here, I was a yeah. uh, Minnesota Viking season ticket holder. So uh, as far as the Super Bowl, I'm used to disappointment. So uh, anybody, we will, we'll see you next month. We will keep you informed and uh, have a great day and stay safe. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Ash. Andy, will you explain the uh, how to use the Zoom chat? So uh, for questions today, we would like to use the Zoom chat feature uh, rather than uh, the way we've done it in the past. So uh, Rick was nice enough to put together a couple of slides to describe how to do that. Uh, the first slide on how to use the chat feature, feature is how to use it on a PC. Uh, so you have to move your cursor 
over over the zoom window to see the control uh, menu bar uh, probably at the bottom of your screen uh, in the menu bar you'll see an item for chat you left click on that in the, in the pop-up window it gives you an option for who you want to send the chat to so for questions send the chat to everyone and then you can type your message in there type your question and hit enter so that that's how you would uh, send a question by chat uh, on a PC, and there, there were actually a couple of questions, Ash, already waiting for you in the chat. Uh, and then if you're on your phone or on a, on a tablet, uh, on a mobile device, the chat feature is accessed a little differently. Uh, you, you have to tap the screen uh, to see the menu bar, where on the PC it would come up automatically, but on a mobile device, you have to tap the screen. And then you get the menu bar, you tap more on the menu bar. Then you'll get a menu, you pick chat from the menu. And uh, similar to the people on the PC, you make sure your uh, message is going to everyone and tap at the bottom where it says tap here. And you enter the question and you tap the send icon. So hopefully that was clear. I know that was a little quick, but hopefully uh, that uh, will help everybody.